John, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're here to talk about your composition, Listening to Lutsu. Um, I'm especially curious about this piece. I think it's a magnificent piece. And um, there's so many there's so many thematic elements mm. that emerge from this music. And I have a feeling that most of those start with the text themselves. So as I understand it, the poem, yeah. the libretto, is a poem from Li Po. Tell us about that and why it's significant to Harry Parch's work. Well, that's basically how Harry Parch got started. His first compositions for his microtonal instruments with these wonderful pieces called 17 Lyrics by Li Po. And Li Po are known as Li Bai, depending on, on who. A medieval uh, Chinese poet who Parch just loved. He was very well read. Mm -hmm. And people have always sort of laughed afterwards because Li Po was always talking about being drunk and taking away. And in his later years, Parch was known to be a wanderer and enjoying his, he was in his cups, as mm -hmm. Lou Harrison would say. Mm -hmm. So uh, Parch was drawn to him, and of course, because I have been obsessed with Harry Parch's music for so long, and in fact went so far as to make an adapted viola so I could learn some of those pieces. I'm still exactly. working on them. I'm going to get them all one of these days. And I fell in love with the literature. It's just wonderful. Mm. But I went a step further and ended up uh, buying collections of Li Po's uh, texts. Different translators, the ones that Parch used was published in uh, 1922. Just for fun, I bought a collection by David Hinton, who is a poet who did other translations of exactly the same pieces. And I thought, hmm. what would it be like? What was a midnight farewell really from another point of view? And sure enough, the words are different. So Chinese well, characters, sure. <laughs> sure. they bear a lot of translation. So while I was thrumming, thumbing through all of these, I noticed there were quite a few pieces that Li Po wrote had to do with musical instruments. Interesting. So I started digging, and there's five or six uh, that talk about the, the ancient Chinese instrument, the qin, or the gu qin, or there's many different different pronunciations. It was known as the, the musical instrument for, for poets and for philosophers. Confucius was actually meant to play the, the gu qin, or the qin. Interesting. And it, it's, it's strange and wonderful instrument. It's about six and a half feet long. It has seven silk strings and the soundboard is the instrument but it's sort of, if you know what a, a, a koto looks like, mm -hmm. those little bridges, there are no bridges. You hold down the strings and you can slide them one way or the other with the thumbnail, with the skin. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it has little diamond markers on it, so you can play the harmonics up and down. It does just about everything. Sounds like very familiar to an instrument we already know. You bet, you bet. <laughs> and in fact, there is, um, I did some research years ago about tone color with plucked strings and read a modern translation of an instrumental uh, catalog of its sounds. How do you play the Guccine? And there are about 15 or 20 different kinds of vibrato. How could that be? Hmm. Well, on guitar, you can go like this, up and back and forth. And there are all these wonderful things you can do with the thumb and the skin, but the hippest vibrato of all is when you press down on the string and the blood rushing through the tip of your finger is the vibrato. Now that's a little metaphysical, right? It's pretty I'll out say. There. So I found this amazing poem about a, a, a holy man, I suppose, uh, named Lu Tzu, and he was in the mountains playing the qin. A recluse playing on his chin. Wow, what an amazing thing. What a contemplative, quiet thing. Now, when I was reading these, I happened to be on tour with uh, a bunch of folks, who, uh, a Dutch group, who are now known as Scortatura. And mm -hmm. I had my, my adapted guitar with me. I had brought the adapted, um, uh, not the adapted, the diamond marimba with me, too. Mm -hmm. And we were doing this Dutch tour all over the country. And I had a lot of time alone. So I got to read these pieces. And I looked at that instrument. And I was playing the rose. And I thought, wait a minute. This, this sounds like a gene. Why don't I? And that's where this piece came from. Very interesting. <laughs> I love it in just the sense that the inspiration truly came from the text first. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so then the application, what you're going to create on the instrument, is an extension of that libretto, the extension of the words and the moods, the emotion that come through that. Also an, uh, an extension of tune technique. 
because okay. over the years I have also looked far and wide for recordings on these instruments. And there are masters that are in their 80s and 90s uh, who were recorded in the 40s. So mm -hmm. we're getting closer and closer to the old tradition. And I had the sound in my ear. I knew what it sounded like when they played those harmonics and had those gliding tones. Mm -hmm. So um, I had an image and I had the poetry. Then I started messing around, of course, with the tuning. And I, I changed the tuning slightly to match. Uh, Parch has basically a major tuning and a minor tuning on this instrument. And yet it wasn't exactly right, so I did a scordatura. I changed mm -hmm. the, the open strings and found uh, different sounds that worked well. And while playing, heard melodies. Again, mm -hmm. the, the instrument sort of told me what worked and what didn't. Mm -hmm. And I just started writing and couldn't stop. <laughs> Very interesting. So if you're changing the open strings of the guitar to match more what's happening on the gene. Um, for our audience who's listening, um, you can see on the fretboard of this instrument that John is holding this very beautiful mosaic of many colored triangles. And they represent, John, tell us what those represent, those different triangles. Well, they represent the different fretboard. notes, actually, okay. single notes, because Harry Parch wrote his music not in notes, but in numbers most of the time. Ratios, relationships to a basic note, which is usually a, a G. So uh, he did that, but he also, because it's hard to look at a whole bunch of fractions and see what they mean, you have to kind of look and it takes too long. He came up with a color scheme. Hmm. So, and they're basically, as I'm fond of saying, the, the Grateful Dead colors, right? It's okay. six basic colors of the rainbow. Uh, it starts with red, goes to orange, yellow, green, blue, and then violet. And those refer to the root, the third, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, and the eleventh harmonic mm -hmm. of the harmonic mm -hmm. series. So uh, when he gets to something that has a ratio of five and four, well five relates to the third harmonic, so that's going to be yellow. The fourth divides to two, goes down to one. Ah, so that's red, that's the basic one. So if you see red, uh, sorry, uh, yellow over red, that means that's going to be a, a major third, a five four. Mm -hmm. And that's where you put, oh, small detail. There's no frets on this. This is uh -huh. a slide guitar. And this is a copy, by the way. Sure. Because uh, Parch's own instrument, he took a Hawaiian guitar, a, a square neck as they're known, because okay. they weren't played in the lap, and then used a, a plexiglass rod to... And there's bass now. But there's also chords. And you can do... Or there's a lot of octaves, actually, open stringing. Mm. An amazing chord. Very That's strange. wonderful. Wonderful. So the thing that really got me excited about this about this poem is that here he is. The moon is out. It's the middle of the night and the wind starts blowing through the trees, and he hears these sounds. And I had, while, uh, while working with this instrument, realized, you know, I've been, I've been going up and down, up and down all, you know, for years, learning how to play it. And all of a sudden, one day, quite by mistake, instead of going up and down, I went across the strings, and the weirdest thing happened. I thought, what the heck was that? I mean, did I make a mistake? And then. And I realized that after all of the months and years of going up and down, I'd made little tiny grooves on part of this plexiglass rod, because it's only plastic after mm. all. And you can get these really cool sounds. You can bow the strings with the rod. So... That brings a smile to my face every time I hear it. I know. Uh -huh. It just it shivers down your spine, uh, right? Goosebumps. I, I have to say, the first time I heard this piece was a recording that you did from a live concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to get familiar with the music, because I knew we were, we were going to be recording this. And so I just wanted to listen a few times and just get this in my ear and start imagining the recording process. Um, and then I heard this sound. 
And I found myself stopping and just staring at the screen and thinking, <laughs> how in the world is this being produced? Because this is not an amplified instrument. Well, it does have at, a pickup. Okay. And we can amplify it, but, but it's not like going through Ebo. pedals or anything like right. that. Right. So the first place where my imagination took me, this has got to be an Ebo sort of technique, mm. right? The electronic bow that electronic is used on string driver, right? Okay. On electric guitars, but that's a relationship between the magnetic pickups on the guitar. That's what mm. makes that work, right? The Ebo work and thinking, okay, if he doesn't have multiple pickups on this that generate that magnetic field, what's going what's on? What's <laughs> vibrating here? And I'm just staring at this and I think I called you and I said, you got to talk to me about this technique. Yeah. It is amazing. And so this technique, like so many discoveries in music, is one of those happy accidents. Yeah, absolutely. Now here's the crazy thing that, you know, I've been playing this piece a lot you can't predict what's going to happen. Right. Every time it's different. So if I go up to it and I go, okay, I'm going to move my to exactly to where it says 16-9 and rub back and forth, I should get all these strings an octave higher. Okay, let's do that. No, that's not happening. High frequencies come in, low frequencies, and of course, it's still a slide rod. And if you go this way and do diagonals, you get higher frequencies. Hours of fun, right? <laughs> So could we accurately say that these moments in the composition with this rod are, what's the proper term? Improvised to a degree, um, indeterminate? In a, in a bit. Uh, it's what a friend of mine used to call comprovisation. It's, it's okay. composed, but it's improvised at the same time. And I just have to pay attention. All right. It's like anything else. I start the machine going and it's like anything, if you're on stage and you're creating a moment, you follow that moment. You're not going to go, oh, I'm going to start over at that one. And you what can I want. manipulate it to a degree. Sure, right. sure. And I can also uh, damp it with this hand. Hmm. So you're not throwing sticks to the wind, in no, other words. No, 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 no. Okay. No, it's within, I know basically what's going to happen, but in the heat of the moment, I'm in the heat of the moment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you never know what's going to come out. Um, so in the recording that we're about to play, of course, uh, when I recorded that, all of a sudden I heard some new things. And I said, oh, let's follow that. That's, mm. that's an interesting sound. Let's make that one go a little bit longer. Ah, oh, and mm. the phrase told me when to end it. So. Right. <laughs> that's beautiful. Well, it's, it's a composition that transports the listener to another place. Mm. And I think that's one of the hallmarks of not just quality music, but meaningful music, mm. in that it can grab the listener and it can take the listener to a new place, letting the music interact with the imagination. At least this is what it does for me. I, it takes me to a forest deep in the mountains uh, and I can literally hear wind moving through the trees, which this instrument becomes the metaphor yeah, yeah. of. That's what I look for in music. I want to be in the music. I want it to, to captivate me. I want right. to be transformed and transported. And hopefully our listeners will too. Yeah. <laughs> I always wonder what would Harry Parch think of other compositions that were written on his instruments by other composers? And I think this is one of the ones that he would say, this one, follow this. Because it's that, it, it follows in line with his sensibility. Because in so much of his music, the lyric drives mm. the material. He came to the poem, um, the essay, as with Thomas Wolfe and Dark Brother, right? He comes to this and says, okay, this is the part that I'm going to set to music here. And then begins the process of com of composing. Mm. And you followed in a similar path to this. And while I think the output is very different from something Parch that would have written, um, I think it's just as impactful 
because it's it's in a similar milieu. Um, then my job here is done. Yeah, well, and <laughs> job well done, sir. It's a wonderful composition. Thank you. So Thank you. let's take a listen now. This is Listening to Lutsu by John Schneider. Harry Parch's adapted guitar sounds a lot like an ancient Chinese chin. The ancient table zither strung those seven silk strings. and said to be the favorite of Confucius. Its sliding notes, harmonics, and subtleties of expression famously inspired a thousand years of music. Parch's guitar, though, has a few new tricks up its sleeve. The night is lazy, the moon bright. Sitting here, a recluse plays his pale white chin. suddenly as if cold pines were singing it's all those harmonies of grieving wind Emerald watered clarities. No one understands now. Those who could hear a song this deeply vanished long ago. Mm -hmm. 